Hi, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I'm your host, DJ Sandwich V. At your services, and you're listening to the Across Canada Trails Mix podcast. On today's show, we will explain the difference between a GPX file and a KML file. And you might ask why. Why? Oh, and my co host today is the extranormal.com voice of Queen Elizabeth. How are you? You didn't answer my question. And any more fine, then I'd be mush. So thank you for having me on your podcast, for Across Canada Trails Mix. I'm sure it will be good for me. Right. The background music that you are hearing in the background and on loop playback is, is a track called Happy Alley by Kevin McLeod from Incompetech.com. Please check out the website for other great free sounds. Also, the intro sound clip was from Extranormal.com as one of the preset background sounds. Moving on then. GPS tracks are the backbone of how maps get made. A GPS is a global positioning system. Just like me? Almost. Not quite though. It is the way. Basic concept of GPS. A GPS receiver calculates its position by precisely timing the signals sent by GPS satellites high above the Earth. Each satellite continually transmits messages that include the time the message was transmitted, precise orbital information, the ephemeris, the general system health and rough orbits of all GPS satellites, the almanac. The receiver uses the messages it receives to determine the transit time of each message and computes the distance to each satellite. These distances along with the satellite's locations are used with the possible aid of trilliteration, depending on which algorithm is used, to compute the position of the receiver. This position is then displayed, perhaps with a moving map display or latitude and longitude. Elevation information may be included. Many GPS units show derived information such as direction and speed, calculated from position changes. Uh Three satellites might seem enough to solve for positions in space as three dimensions and a position near the Earth's surface can be assumed. However, even a very small clock error multiplied by the very large speed of light, 35, the speed at which satellite signals propagate, results in a large positional error. Therefore receivers use four or more satellites to solve for the receiver's location and time. The very accurately computed time is effectively hidden by most GPS applications, which use only the location. A few specialized GPS applications do however use the time. These include time transfer, traffic signal timing, and synchronization of cell phone base stations. Ah, uh-huh. Don't get it. Right. It's GeoGeek. I'd recommend checking the Wikipedia article on Global Positioning System. Okay, I'll take note of it. Carry on. So the product that is produced from a GPS device is generally called a GPS track. This is a computer file with .gpx at the end, and can be opened up with various programs. For the Garmin brand GPS device, a program called MapSource is used. This allows for the elevation and date slash time stamps to be visible. This is unlike a KML file. Okay, so what is a KML file? Some kind of magic? No quite. It's what you would find after drawing on top of a map, for example. When you use Google Maps and create your own map, you chose the line drawing tool and draw a line. But what's missing is the elevation and accuracy information. This is vacuous when drawing on a map, you are using someone else's work, the person or people who originally created the map. Uh Okay, from Wikipedia, the source of all wisdom. The article, Keyhole and Markup Language, explains. Shoot. What? I stubbed my toe. How? It's dark in here. Really? We are inside the internet. I haven't noticed. Very well. Carry on with all your magic talk. Keyhole and markup language, KML, is an XML notation for expressing geographic annotation and visualization within internet-based, two-dimensional maps and three-dimensional Earth browsers. 
KML was developed for use with Google Earth, which was originally named Keyhole Earth Viewer. It was created by Keyhole, Inc., which was acquired by Google in 2004. KML is an international standard of the Open Geospatial Consortium. Google Earth was the first program able to view and graphically edit KML files. Other projects such as Marble have also started to develop KML support. How nice! Well, if I go into any more detail, other geo geeks will get all excited. Really? No. But there is some technicality which I might have misquoted, but the point is. In order for trails to be accurately mapped that is shown on top of a map, they need to first be in the GPX file format, and directly from a handheld GPS device, otherwise referred to as raw GPS tracks. Right. So when we want to show a trail on top of a map, we want to use a raw GPS track log file, rather than tracing. How did you know about track log? I googled it already. Smart. Yes, I am. Very well then. So we want to use real GPS tracks when building the Across Canada Trails network. This will allow for great accuracy and authenticity, showing the world this trail. Sounds good. What's next on the show? I'm going to play a YouTube clip that I created back in September, which was for a job interview with the Trans Canada Trail head office to get the job in Montreal as a GIS trails assistant. Did you get the job? No. They said that no senior staff was available to meet with me. And it doesn't help that I am direct competition. Really? I'll play the clip. It's a muzzing. Yes. It was quite a muzzing. And no. No non-competition agreement has been signed. Just continuous bickering about ATV use by the public and various trails groups. Something that could be solved with a clear vision. Right. Moving on then. Okay. These GPX track or raw GPS track files are important, as they have the original date slash time stamp and can and will get uploaded to various track sharing websites. Really? Yes, people can actually upload and share GPS tracks and it doesn't need to just be held on just one website. Like how the Trans-Canada Trail website holds and copyrights the KML files and the GP extracts which were actually just converted and not actually original. You mean to say that the public can actually contribute to building the Trans-Canada Trail? No. As was said in the clip earlier, the Trans-Canada Trail does not share and has no actual interesting collaboration. Right. The Trans-Canada Trail is only interested in book sales, and they have no interest in us commoners, as we apparently have no ability to create good quality GPS tracks. Right. This is why the Across Canada Trails project exists. Instead of expecting the government to build a national trail, we use the volunteer contributions of individual trail users who are out there exploring the trails. We then simply assign a reference number and use an open access spreadsheet and collaboration blog sits and open Facebook pages and groups along with Google Plus and Twitter to coordinate everything. Sounds easy enough. So instead of an executive exclusive club who pays a $200 dollar entry fee in order to sit down at the AGM, we, the trail users, Use open collaboration and free technology to publish and build the National Trails Network for everyone to enjoy. Okay, and what about QR codes? I have seen these posted along with the registered GPS track segments. What is it? Well, it is similar to a barcode, the thing that you would see on most items in a grocery store or retail store. It is a symbol that holds a reference. Traditionally it just holds a series of numbers. But this QR code can hold many things, as reference. But from the book of all things known, Wikipedia article it states, A QR code, abbreviated from quick response code, is a type of matrix barcode or two-dimensional code, first designed for the automotive industry. More recently, 
The system has become popular outside of the industry due to its fast readability and comparatively large storage capacity. The code consists of black modules arranged in a square pattern on a white background. The information encoded can be made up of any kind of data, for example binary, alphanumeric, or kanji symbols. I knew that. How? On my cordless internet computing device. Phone. But I still have not figured out where to put the quarters into this device to keep it working. Did you know that your cell phone probably has an iPhone app that lets you record your trips? And upload the trip online? Yes. Well, that would record the original GPS track logs. So it's important to check with a GeoGeek and see if your track that you produced is good to be part of the National Trails Network. And why shouldn't it? Becuos, although the phone has a GPS chip, the accuracy might not be as good. The outdoor Garmin GPS is better as PS tracks and waypoints. All right, let's change the tone a little, and how about some music? Okay, here's a fun song it's called Using GPS. It's by The Lost Navigators. I don't have permission to use it, but I do have reference to this YouTube clip in the credits. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy. What? This next song is called Credit is Due Attribution by Nina Pally. Check out http colon slash slash blog dot nina pally dot com slash two zero one one slash zero six slash two seven slash credit dash is dash due slash. What? Yes. It's important to state where you got the work from. This next song is called Copying is Not Theft, official version, also by Nina Pally. Check out the YouTube clip. The direct link is on the credits list slash description. I think that is all the time we have for today's podcast. I'm your host DJ Sandwich V. And my guest co host today is the extra normal.com voice of Queen Elizabeth. This has been a Cross Canada Trails mix recording. It's good for you.